by the big clock on the wall, it's two o'clock. I'm Bob Wilcott, who was asked to introduce Bob Curl. And this year's alumni college was uh, designed to provide introductions that may not be the things that are on the website. In uh, late 1980s, Bob and I were playing squash fairly regularly. Uh, Bob can be taciturn at times. Came in one day complaining about his machinery was broken, it was getting the wrong answer. I had described in some details what was the matter with his mass spectrometer. And a couple of months later, he came in in a state of shock and said, Rick Smalley has won a Nobel Prize last night. Well, I looked in the newspaper, and it apparently hadn't happened. This was late 1980s. In 1996, I was proceeding downtown to have an automobile serviced and listening to KUHF, and they said, Professor Smalley at Rice and the Englishman named Croto and a third person whose name was garbled in the press release were announced as this year's Nobel laureates. And I figured, well, that sounds like I better go by the Curls house to see. Now, Robert met me at the front door and said, well, it's got to be true if a busybody like you knows it. <laughs> and we proceeded to the Rice campus. Now, the order of the day was that we would stop at the Dean of Science's office and say to Jim Kinsey, have you heard? Jim said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. They're waiting in Fondren Library. Let's go. Now, this was pre-entourage since it was quite early. And Malcolm Gillis was appearing to walk down a walk. And uh, Jim Kinsey and Robert and I headed for the library. And we heard him say, Professor Curl say, well, there goes my day. <laughs> and Jim Kinsey and I still laugh about that. Today is day 3,771 and counting. All of those days are gone. His life went, underwent a radical change in that one hour period. But today we're going to hear about hitching a ride on a comet. And you can measure for yourself what good, quiet, academic, hardworking scientists do for a living. Bob? Thank you. Oh, that's, uh, I feel like I got through that introduction uh, virtually unscathed, knowing Bob. Uh, the, uh, I thought he might have some other stories to tell. Uh, so, I, the, uh, I have, I'm going to start off on a sad note for, for Rice. Uh, and we lost two giants on the faculty very prematurely. Uh, Rick died about uh, uh, 16 months ago, and uh, Ken Kennedy just died a couple of weeks ago. And both of these people <coughs> uh, have a, had a, a strong, a great influence on the development of Rice University. Uh, and their deaths were very premature. Rick was 62 and Ken was 61. So um, I just hope that uh, some of the young folks can do come close to uh, make, you know replacing them. I think it will be extremely hard. So um, I'd like to make a little a few personal rem reminiscences on Rick. Uh, Rick was a good friend. I miss him. I was really saddened by his death. He should have lived a whole lot longer. Uh, and I'd, what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about uh, what it was like to work with Rick. Uh, it really was like hitching a ride on a comet. Um, and we, we, we did, Rick and I shared some of the <coughs> most exhilarating experiences that a scientist can have. Uh, I also want to tell you uh, a bit about what, Rye, what Rick was uh, fascinated with uh, toward the end of his life. Uh, this is the story of the carbon nanotubes. It's also the story of trying to develop momentum for a uh, Sputnik-like era uh, for energy research, uh, like, a, like the, the present equivalent of, a, of the Apollo program. Uh, 
so um, let me start with the beginning as I saw it. Um, Rick uh, interviewed for an assistant professor job at Rice in 1976. Uh, and he told us about his postdoctoral work that he's been doing at the University of Chicago, and it blew us away. It was the most exciting science that I'd heard in a long time. And we took the almost unprecedented step of offering him a job on the spot. Uh, we usually, we, somebody will come and interview, and we, they say, we'll think about it and get back to you. Uh, that's, that's almost always the case. Uh, so he came and he um, set up his lab in record time and uh, he started uh, doing his experiments. Uh, he was doing spectroscopy at Chicago and I'm a long-term spectroscopist so I really was keen to do spectroscopy with him using the techniques that he had pioneered at the University of Chicago. But I had this now completely crazy notion at the time it seemed to make sense that you don't want to have a full professor and assistant professor working together because all the credit will go to the, uh, to the full professor. So I, I said, oh, I can wait a little while before we can get together a little bit later. Uh, anyway, in the period between when he started in the fall of 1976, and when he became a full professor in 1981, uh, it's sort of unusual. He was an assistant professor for about almost five years and an associate professor for less than one. Um, they, um, uh, he, in that period of time, he created four research fields. Incredibly creative work. Uh, and most of those fields are still exciting, although he long ago abandoned them uh, to this day. Now, um, many of the things that Rick did during that period were exciting developments in spectroscopy. And as I said, I'm very interested in spectroscopy. I, th I, I thought that we, and now was the time, it was clear that, it, that Rick was a star. I, certainly wouldn't take anything away from him. And um, we started collaborating. And the, um, uh, we started collaborating with this, on this machine. This whole thing is the machine. That's Mike Alford, uh, one of his graduate students. And the, uh, this machine, the purpose of this was to create clusters of highly refractory materials, things that are very difficult to vaporize. Vaporize only at very high temperatures. And then uh, look at these clusters by a variety of spectroscopies, optical, mass spectroscopy, uh, a number of other clever things that Rick invented. And what uh, we started to do was, was look at clusters of semiconductors. Uh, we looked at silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, and the purpose of this, at least the way we sold it to the Army Office of Research, uh, was that, that computer elements were getting smaller and smaller. Computer elements are made of these semiconductors. And eventually, uh, you would have effects that were caused by the, all of the atoms being in the surface of the, of the element. And that, that's true. Uh, uh, what well, didn't turn out to be so true is that we great, gained great insights into what was going to happen when these got very small. We did learn a lot about clusters, uh, but not necessarily, and it's hard to see how that would, would, would affect computers. Uh, maybe it would someday. So, um, they, um, here's a picture of Rick on top of the machine. Uh, that's big science to me. I mean, you, we, this big chamber here, uh, you, got, you essentially crawled inside it to, to swab it out. So any apparatus that you can get inside of is big, is big science, as far as I'm concerned. This is called AP2. Uh, what Rick is doing here is he's, he's putting a little uh, element between this laser and, the, um, and this uh, region where we, we were uh, 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 ionizing the clusters that had been made. And the reason this needed to go in is we were switching to a laser 
uh, where the, uh, at 157 nanometers, where the air absorbs uh, radiation, oxygen in the air absorbs radiation, and this thing was to be flushed with nitrogen. So um, I'll tell you very briefly about the uh, fullerene discovery story uh, because it, it uh, uh, is very exciting. But there's so much else I want to tell you that it, will, it, will be a, it won't be the full story. Many of you have probably already heard it. Um, so we could vaporize anything and make clusters. And Harry Croto had wanted to look at some clusters of carbon uh, containing around 12 carbon atoms. So in an entirely different region. What this is is a mass spectrum of the cluster distribution. Uh, and essentially the height of these peaks tells you something about uh, the number of clusters of that size. What, what happened in the course of uh, the work looking at these, these uh, smaller clusters, these were chains of carbon atoms, we could get the whole spectrum. And uh, under most conditions, the spectrum looked like this. Occasionally, the spectrum would look like this. And so the logical thing to do uh, after you've got all of the important work of looking at these, these uh, smaller clusters done, is to think, well, this is kind of strange that this is big fluctuation and this gets rather high at some times. So after a team decision, we, that is Jim Heath, working by himself in the middle of the night, uh, was able to get this spectrum at the top. And what this tells you is that this, there's something really special about this 60 carbon atom structure. So uh, the question was, uh, what was special? Well, uh, what was going on and going from these panels indicated that uh, this thing that was special about carbon 60 was it was very inert chemically. And so you wanted to look for some, some way of putting 60 carbon atoms together and make it very inert chemically. And so this suggested some sort of closed cage compound. Uh, so the, um, what happened was that uh, Harry remembered vaguely that he had made something that was roughly spherical in shape. And it, it contained uh, pentagons and it contained hexagons and you'd be, be, what you'd be doing would be putting carbon atoms at the vertices where the, this is a polyhedron he had made, uh, where the, the, the uh, corners intersected. And he thought that, that maybe this would have 60 vertices. But he, of course, couldn't remember he'd done this some years ago. So uh, with that small clue, Rick went home and created this object, uh, which uh, uh, he did, you know, obviously cutting out these pieces uh, and making the edges the same and then taping the edges together. He found immediately that if you, if you started with only hexagons, that whatever you made was flat, like a bathroom floor with, with hex hexagonal tiles. But if you put in some pentagons, the first, if you put six hexagons around a pentagon, it curved into a bowl. And he began to get excited because you wanted something that closed up. The reason you wanted closure is so that the, uh, there wouldn't be any, any place for chemical reaction due to some dangling chemical bond. So anyway, I, 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 I can just imagine what it was like. He was, you know, oh, I made a bowl. Then he started trying to build up on this, and he curved up more and more to close. And I'm sure Rick got more and more excited. So finally, it closed on itself. And then he, then he um, that was only like two or three o'clock in the morning. And he, he counted all the corners, counted them again, numbered all the corners, checked all the numbers were different, and they turned out to have 60 corners that would correspond to where the 60 carbon atoms were. So I think he probably stayed up the rest of the night waiting until the time for work to begin so that he could come in and show us this. Uh, so he did, and, and uh, he came in, we quickly wrote a paper in about probably less than 24 hours, sent it off to Nature and then posed for the team picture. And so of course here's Rick and this is Harry, this is Jim Heath, Sean O'Brien and me. Uh, and the person in the background is our mystery woman. Uh, 
somebody, someday somebody's going to come forward and say, I'm the mystery woman. Um, anyway, um, it turned out that this, this idea of carbon cages, particularly the one with 60 carbon atoms, it's, it's soccer ball-like, that's why I'm holding a soccer ball. It has the same structure as a traditional soccer ball. That kind of, of uh, cage had been thought up uh, for 14 years ago by a guy in uh, Japan, and there was actually an organic chemist at UCLA that was trying to make this compound by the normal methods of organic synthesis. He never succeeded, but, but he, he was trying. So it wasn't uh, the concept of this all, which is what we thought was the big deal at the time. What the really big deal is, is that this stuff is forming when carbon condenses under the right condition, conditions, and actually it can create, form at pretty good yield. Uh, I remember when I took organic chemistry from Richter, uh, I don't know whether other people here, I'm sure, took organic chemistry from Richter. I don't know whether he told everybody in every class this, but I remember him telling our class specifically that, okay, in principle, if you take some ammonia and some charcoal and shake it up together, there would be, it could be a few molecules of almost any organic compound that you wanted in this, in this, uh, little vial of ammonia water. If you put that down on, on a test as a synthesis method, you're going to get zero. Uh, and it's, you all know Richter what didn't hesitate to give zeros. Uh, so, um, the, uh, uh, so having vaporizing a bunch of graphite and having it condense and make something as esoteric as this perfectly symmetrical molecule is sort of the equivalent of shaking charcoal up with uh, ammonia water. You know, I still can't get over this, that, that this actually happened. It's, uh, it's, it was amazing. Now, I should tell you a little bit about what was like working with Rick during this period. And in fact, all the time working with Rick, uh, but particularly in this time, generally Rick at the, in that stage of his career would have a group meeting every morning uh, I think the group meeting, he, well, there was some concession to humanity. I think the group meeting didn't start till nine on a typical day. And the meetings were extremely intense. We would argue and, and people would propose experiments and other people would shoot them down. And, and uh, everybody participated in these discussions uh, on an equal basis. People would challenge other people. People, you know, beginning graduate students would challenge Rick about, about something. And the amazing thing about Rick was is if your argument was logical, if you, if you approached him from what of you of logic, he would meet your logic with his logic. And his logic was usually better, but, but sometimes he would say, oh, you're right. You know, your, your idea, your approach is a better one. Anyway, we'd, what we'd be doing was looking over yesterday's experiments and then trying to figure out what experiments to do today. And after a decision was reached about what experiments should be done today, then the meeting would be over and go on again. So um, the, um, the, we were, anyway, uh, Rick and I worked together on uh, carbon chemistry and the, um, we went back actually for a while to doing the uh, uh, semiconductor clusters until about 1992. Now, what happened was in 1990, some other folks figured out how to make macroscopic samples of, the, of C60 and the other fullerenes. So all of these, all of these, um, all these even, these are only even numbered carbon atoms here, and all of these even numbered carbon atom uh, systems turned out to be cage molecules just of different structures from C60. Uh, so we worked together until uh, 1992. What happened is, was that in 1990, an uh, uh, Arizona uh, German group uh, found a way of making bulk samples of C60. We, we had tried. Uh, to make C60 in the lab without success. But they found a way to do it, and their process was astonishingly simple. I used to 
they just run a carbon arc under under an inner atmosphere at the right pressure, and you make C60 and, and collect it in the soot and extract it chemically. Uh, I used to wake up every morning for years kicking myself. Uh, that was the first first, first order of get up, kick yourself, and have breakfast, go to work. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it, in 1990, things really took off. Thousands of papers were coming out uh, about the fullerenes. The organic chemists took it over, uh, and the material scientists took it over. And uh, fundamentally, I've, we both faced a decision. Uh, change from being a physical chemist uh, to being an organic chemist and material scientist or not. And I chose not to change. And Rick said, well, all the opportunities are over here in carbon. I'm going to change. Uh, I'm not afraid of, of starting all over again and learning something new. And so, so we sort of stopped working together. Rick never hesitated to take up a subject if he thought it was important. And he never worried about whether he could do it or not. He just chose to push on. So um, the, the guys in Germany got us a Nobel Prize, really. I, I think that Bob exaggerated. I don't recall I think uh, saying that I thought we were going to get a Nobel Prize in the you 80s. Said, you said Rick. Okay. Well, that was a little different. You know, I, I could tell by the early 80s that Rick was destined to get a Nobel Prize. I just didn't know when or what subject. It, I wasn't sure it was on the floor age. Um, anyway, these guys, the guys that found the Moya macro, macroscopic synthesis and essentially, you know, created uh, uh, thousands of people working on it, got us the Nobel Prize because now this became a, something different from a laboratory, laboratory curiosity and became a new branch of chemistry. Uh, and so the, the, um, fortunately for us, they chose us. Anyway, this is Rick getting a prize from King uh, Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden uh, in 1996. Now, winning a prize changed all our lives. It's, it just does, okay. And Rick, uh, in contrast to me, used the prize as a tool uh, to further the aims of his, of his fertile mind and his driving zeal. He uh, remained absolutely committed to doing what he conceived as the most important research at, at the moment. Uh, but he also began to push out and push the direction of research of other people. That is, uh, his, he uh, became very interested in um, uh, lots of areas. And I'll talk to you a minute about this pushing uh, the, the political pushing he did to do other people, but I wanted to spend just a minute more on the on the fullerene story to give you some idea of of what he was thinking about and how imaginative he was at that time. Uh, one of the things that occurred to him quite early that was that you could make a long fullerene, you could extend the cage structure. Essentially, this is a one end of C60, and that's the other end of C60. I think that's, I'm not sure if this is C60 based or some a larger fullerene based thing, but you could extend this and make a tube of hexagons, and this would be very strong. Uh, we, people argue about how strong it will be, but it would be many, uh, the tensile strength would be many times that of steel. What many is is a, a number up subject to debate, but it's one number that's been bandied about as 100 times the tensile strength of steel. Be the strongest, uh, for stretching, the strongest known material. Uh, and theoretic, theoreticians calculated that uh, it, it, uh, the tubes would either be semiconducting for electricity or metallic. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the first thing to think about is the strength. For literally centuries, uh, people have thought about climbing a stairway to heaven. Uh, this is Jack and the Beanstalk, but it could be Jacob's Ladder equally well. Uh, going to the, uh, climbing, climbing to a new world, climbing to a new regime. 
And H.C. Clark, H. C., you know, Arthur C. Clark, sorry, I'm thinking about my geology professor there. H. H. Arthur C. Clark wrote a, a novel called Fountains of Paradise, which involved an elevator to space. They were uh, to take things up, and so uh, this is a, this is what Rick fashioned, fastened on as the most imaginative thing you could do. For NASA, you could build a, a carbon nanotube elevator to space. Uh, and although, uh, to me, originally it seemed like this could violate some of the laws of physics, uh, I think it actually, you can actually work it so it doesn't violate any of the laws of physics. Only nano carbon nanotubes would be strong enough and light enough to make this cable. Any other cable would break of its own weight. So his dream was to make cables, initial dream was to make cables of carbon nanotubes and make this as a uh, elevator to space. Now, we'll see in a minute that this was not the most important use Rick con contemplated for carbon nanotubes. The carbon nanotubes were actually an integral part of his vision to save the world. Uh, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, the, uh, only Rick could say I'm planning to save the world and, ble and mean it. Um, so um, I hope that, um, that uh, when you get through with me that maybe you will agree that maybe the world does need saving and that we do need to start now. So I guess I've convinced you by now that Rick was a visionary. <laughs> It's in the true sense of being visionary. Uh, but he was also very pragmatic. Uh, he knew that if he could make carbon nanotubes that they would find other uses that would be important uses and it, wouldn't, it, it would not be, it, you would not have to build your elevator to space or even build uh, the, the other thing that he was, was interested in. So carbon nanotubes have found uh, useful things. So the, the process that Rick invented to do this, this is the main process used today, is called uh, the HIPCO process because it involves high pressure carbon monoxide. Essentially, you disproportionate carbon monoxide into CO2 and carbon. And if you do this in the presence of iron carbonyl at elevated temperatures and pressures, you get, can create single wall nanotubes. Uh, and so this is the way that they're made. It's a nice continuous process. Uh, the, um, it's led to a company spinoff, and it's gotten Rice and NASA involved in, use, in working on development of carbon nanotubes, primarily uh, from the point of view of materials. Not, NASA's not thinking so much about the elevator to space, although I guess they wouldn't mind one having one, but they really are thinking about uh, na carbon nanotube-based materials. Um, so, the, um, Rick could see great possibilities in carbon nanotubes, and he had read uh, this short paper by Feynman called Plenty of Room at the Bottom, which postulated that, that um, there would be a flourishing new world of, of science and technology uh, at, at the level of range of, nanome of the size of nanometers. So he um, decided to broaden out and develop and, and try to get nanoscale science and nanotechnology supported lavishly by the federal government. And uh, he became an advocate. He would go to Congress and testify before committees about the importance of nanotechnology. And he would go to, to uh, the White House and, and lobby Neil Lane to, to push nanotechnology uh, with President Clinton. Uh, and he really found an effective way, uh, and it, Rick was a very persuasive person, he found a very effective way of using uh, the Nobel Prize as, a, as an entree uh, into uh, political activity. So uh, one of the things that came out of this was NASA gave, this was in April 26, 2005, NASA awarded, awarded, awarded a $16 million grant to Rice and two NASA centers for research and developing the quantum wire, 
quantum wire is a carbon nanotube that conducts electric electricity. Um, and the most uh, ironic thing about this was that the day after Rick died, NASA canceled the grant. And the reason they canceled the grant was the Moon-Mars program was sucking all of the money for scientific research out of the NASA program. So it wasn't because Rick died. They canceled everybody's grant that day, uh, just about. But uh, it, uh, it was a terrible blow. Anyway, uh, the, um, all of the work that, that Rick did to, to create a nanotechnology initiative in the United States ultimately culminated in the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And Rick uh, the, it, it didn't get it done in the Clinton administration, but early in the uh, Bush administration, it was finally passed. And this is a signing ceremony. And Rick was the only academic in the room. Um, so they, although Rick never lost his fascination and interest in nanotubes and was pushing them until he died, fairly early, early in the game, long before this, uh, he uh, got to thinking about other issues. And one of the issues he was thinking about was, the, was humanity. You know, what what is uh, what's going on with the world and and humanity and uh, the uh, this is the population chart and of course what happened is when natural when sciences came along and the technology that spun out from them the population of the world uh, rapidly increased because the world was more sustainable uh, you know it could sustain more people and so we're now. Uh, over six billion people and still climbing. Uh, so, thinking about this problem, this was 1995, even before the Nobel Prize. Thinking about this problem, whenever Rick thought of a big problem, he said, well, what can I do to solve this big problem? And so he began to think, what are the big problems that face humanity? Now, clearly, the biggest problem is there are too many of us. Uh, you know, if, if the population of the Earth was one billion people, it would be much easier to sustain it. Uh, but I, very few people want to check out to, uh, to may reach that goal. And Rick realized that, that the only way to, to, to bring the population down and stabilize it is by, by educating and empowering women. And there are some some things that Rick didn't feel like he could do uh, and uh, have an impact on and, and so he did know, he did recognize certain limitations. He decided, I can't do anything about that. So what's the next thing you could do to make the world a better place? Well, uh, I mean, some of you may have heard him talk about this. He usually would get the audience to work, you know, to ask the audience what they thought the biggest problems the world faced were. And then convince them that the number one problem was energy. And it's fairly straightforward to, to uh, be convincing of this because if you had abundant cheap energy, you could do a lot more about solving these other problems. You know, if you, there's lots of water around, but much of it's salty. If you have really abundant cheap energy, then you can desalinate water uh, in a cost-effective way. If you have abundant cheap energy, you can make fertilizer to uh, uh, make fertilizer less expensive and thereby increase uh, food production. And if you have abundant cheap energy, you can do lots of things about the uh, environment, etc. So uh, the problem is that our society has been on a fossil fuel jag since sometime in the middle of the 19th century. We use more and more and more fossil fuels. And we're going to run out of some of them. And this, of course, is a somewhat controversial subject. Uh, but I'll try to convince you that, that oil production is limited. Um, this is 
somebody's graph of oil production in a couple of Gaussian fits, assuming that it's going to peak. And of course, the question is uh, not if it's going to peak, but when it's going to peak. Uh, fossil fuels are a naturally limited resource. You know, there's only, there aren't, the, the, we're not making, we're, we're not making more oil at any near, anywhere near the rate at which we're consuming more oil. Same thing is true of natural gas, same thing is true of coal. So all of them are going to peak at some point or another, and the question is when. And this curve is saying it isn't too far away. Uh, and um, I, considering that the uh, consumption by, by uh, China in particular is going up very, very rapidly, uh, I think that uh, this time is, is, this is not an unrealistic curve. Um, so you can see this happening in Texas. The, uh, this graph shows the consumption of energy in Texas. And this is the production of energy in Texas. And they crossed around 1990, depending on, by, and by the comptroller in 1990, by the Railroad Commission in uh, about 1993. So uh, we have, Texas has used its oil up pretty, pretty much. Um, so the kind of situation you're facing is we're the lucky ones. We're here. Your children are likely to be here, and your grandchildren are likely to be here. Now, what is this? This is standard of living. That it's based upon the notion that standard of living means having abundant, cheap ener energy, so that you can fly on jet planes and you can can drive your SUVs or whatever around the world. Uh, so you, it's possible to be happy. Uh, and, and not be able to do those things, but uh, it will be a very different world if, if uh, petroleum and natural gas really become exhausted sometime in the, in the near future. Uh, another thing, as we all know, is where the oil is is not, at the, not very good for us. Um, the, um, well, the biggest pork chunk is in Saudi Arabia. Iran has so got a big chunk. Iraq has got a big chunk. Kuwait has got a big chunk. Venezuela has got a big chunk. These people generally are not too happy with us, uh, and we're depending upon them for gasoline. So um, I have to to. So how did this Rick really get deeply into this? Well. I shouldn't be talking about these. These are this is information I've really gotten from Wade Adams. Wade is here. He should have got up the, and, and, and talked about. I guess you guys had a lunchtime conversation and and discussed the situation and just, and decided that you know this is this is a serious problem. And if you know one thing about Rick, if it's a serious problem, he would do something about it. So he he got. Uh, the Baker Institute and Neil Lane involved. They had uh, some some conferences and workshops set up, uh, and Rick about the same time to got this sort of the slogan: "Be a scientist, save the world." <coughs> so um, now, Rick always did his homework, and so he really did study the problem. The, the, the nano and energy workshops were, were recorded, videotaped, and he went through each of the videotapes five times to try to get every new piece out of it. He, he taught a course on energy for the undergraduates where he would take these bright under, rice undergraduates and give them a problem of coming up with a solution and giving other, other ones the problem of knocking their solution down uh, so that it was... Uh, he got he he got uh, really some really bright people uh, involved in, in in the issues, and he you know he, he talked to all the experts and he did the, the presentation. This presentation is largely his. Uh, rest, the rest of it is Wade's, I think. This part, um, and he began advoca advocacy, uh, and the advocacy is really needed. Uh, and let me tell you his conclusions 
first, and then maybe later we can discuss uh, what uh, what he really said should be done about it. This is sort of this 2003. This is fairly close to what the world is. Uh, what's like this is U.S. consumption. I believe this is U.S. consumption. Is that right? Worldwide. That's worldwide consumption. Okay. This is worldwide consumption. Oil is big. Coal, gas, loot, nuclear is fairly small. Biomass. This is people heating their homes, I think, by, with wood primarily. Uh, and there's some hydroelectric and then other solar wind and geothermal. Now, the problem is that the demand is going to grow. It's clearly going to grow. I mean, the Chinese are going to have all our money. Pretty soon they're going to have all our oil. Uh, and they're going to be consuming it. Uh, and so in 2050, you're going to need at least twice the amount of power available um, as uh, more or less currently available. And the, um, where is it going to come from? Well, essentially, all of these things are limited. Uh, the, uh, if you take the case of nuclear power, worldwide it would take 15,000 uh, one megawatt electric, supplying uh, one megawatt nuclear power plants, that's one megawatt of electricity, uh, to meet this kind of demand. That's one new nuclear power plant worldwide every day. So, uh, and, and of course that would also carry with it uh, reprocessing because you would, you would need to get to recover the fuel. It would, 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 would uh, carry with it uh, dealing with high level radioactive waste. So, you know, he's got uh, nuclear growing, but not by all that much. These are percentages, by the way. Um, and there's no contribution plan for fusion. In 1952, uh, nuclear fusion was the coming thing, but it would be at least 50 years away. Uh, as far as I know, the 50 years has not changed. Uh, so it's always 50 years away. Um, so what Rick was thinking about was solar power. Now, solar power has three problems. Uh, first of all, you have to get the price down. Otherwise, it's not going to be viable. Secondly, the sun goes down which is, means that your power is interrupted, so you either have to have it so widespread that the sun never sets, or you have to have storage. And the third thing is, is that if you're going to do it on an industrial scale, you're going to need to put the solar uh, panels, the solar arrays, where there aren't people, prefer you know, something like a desert. And so that means you have a transmission problem. That may not be the most serious problem, but you do uh, have to to transmit the energy uh, over fairly long distances. And because the quantum of nanotubes had something to do with tra transmission, that was what Rick focused on as, as something that he could do something about, in a, hopefully in a straightforward way. Oh, the, didn't realize this thing was out. They, uh, uh, if you get the right kind of carbon nanotube, an armchair carbon nanotube, they call it, they call it a quantum wire. Effectively, uh, the electrons uh, go over fairly long distances ballistically before they, before they have a scattering event. So you do, you do expect to have quite high conductivity. Um, and the, uh, uh, at least as conductive as copper and probably more. That's something that people don't know much about. It would be much less heavy than, than copper, stronger than steel. And so he wanted to make electrically conducting carbon nanotube wires for conducting electricity from remote regions. And when we're talking remote, he was talking really remote. If you're going to solve the sun goes down problem, you really have to have, you have, to have cables going circulating around the world to uh, carry electricity from where the sun is. Uh, so he wanted to do this. He wanted to make electrically conducting carbon nanotubes. 
Now, the, the issue is that there are different kinds of carbon nanotubes. There's the, the kind that you like are these kind, which are called armchair. Uh, I've never always been puzzled about the armchair aspect. It, the only thing I can conceive of is uh, imagining yourself sitting here and putting your arms out on the side. But uh, there may be a better explanation for what, why these are called armchair tubes. These are all electrically conducting uh, metallic conductors. Most of the other ones are not. You see, you can construct the tubes in a variety of different ways. You can put a twist in them. The other extreme from the armchair is called zigzag because the end is zigzagged. And this is what you want, and you don't want those others. But you make a whole bunch of them. So you have the problem of how do you, how do you get long strands of this particular kind of uh, nanotube. Uh, and the scheme that Rick came up with is called cloning nanotubes. So you, in the HIPCO system, this, these little dots, by the way, are catalyst particles, metal particles. In the HIPCO system, you get a collection of, of raw nanotubes. Then you uh, purify them, that is, by removing the metal in the long fullerene, so you get the, t the tubes out. Then you cut them into short lengths, and you sort them to pick out the ones that you want. This, this has been, this is, this is done, this is done, this is done. This can, it's, it's, one can see how this can be done. It's non-trivial to look at these individual, you can see individual tubes and tell what type they are, but it's, diff, it's not a, it's a relatively challenging problem still. So you pick out the one you want. Uh, by the way, if you don't, if you're, you're gonna, this is gonna be a cycle and you don't need, if you, if you have grown this, it'll still be this way so you don't have to do the sorting anymore. You add a catalyst to the end of the tube and then you run the processing again and amplify the kind of tubes you want. And the, uh, there, are lots, there are many problems to be solved in doing this. Uh, and Rick got to the stage of at least this stage and he actually got this done. Uh, the, the growth business, um, I know that the growth was done on supported catalysts but to extend the length of tubes. Uh, I'm not sure it was done in the HIPCO machine to study the, extend the length of tubes. I don't think so. So just the feasibility did demonstrate the feasibility of extending the length. Anyway, this is a really tough problem. I mean, I'm a, I'm a timid scientist. I would never have undertaken this problem. You know, it's just mind-boggling the, the, the challenges that you have to overface. And I'm very impressed that he got that. This has got as far as he did. He would have gotten further if he'd lived. So this became Rick's mantra. Uh, it, the, the thing is, is that the only way to avoid a future energy crisis is to start working on the problem now and consider, give it a really high priority. Uh, there's no low-hanging fruit in this area. There's nothing that, that you can say, oh, I have this brilliant idea and I'm going to solve this problem tomorrow. Uh, and so this, what this means is means serious federal resending for energy research and it means that more scientists and engineers are needed. Um, and so the Be a Scientist Save the World was Rick's way of trying to get, get uh, young people interested in becoming scientists and engineers. Uh, I think that this slogan really resonated with Rick. Uh, he had a very he heroic vision of life. So, uh, they got, one of the things about Rick's work is that everybody that's anywhere around him gets involved. <laughs> on half of the chemistry department was doing work on carbon nanotubes. Uh, it's been doing work on carbon nanotubes. Rick's wife, uh, who is a, a high school chemistry teacher, was a high school chemistry teacher, is involved, and his son Chad are involved in setting up an organization and a website to promote energy research. So, they, um, 
I like this picture. Richard Smalley was a remarkable person. Um, he had the ability to vacuum up information at a prodigious rate, organize it in his own mind, and then use it creatively uh, to, uh, to develop new science. He, he always was, had the courage to tackle the hardest problems. He never got discouraged. Um, if some experiment didn't turn out the way everyone hoped it would, Rick's attitude, well, is no is a scientific result, and move, he'd move on to the next, next thing. He had a, a really whimsical sense of humor. He kept making up cute names for, for uh, uh, different things. That's, I'm sure, where the armchair came from that I don't, I've never understood. But some of the things were we, when we were working on the fullerenes, we had a character called Jimmy Soot uh, that was supposed to represent the soot growing. Uh, we did we did shrink wrapping to verify the the uh, 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 fullerene hypothesis. We and Rick had for a snag and brag string scheme for growing longer tubes. Um, Rick had a tremendous personal charisma uh, and was really ex incredibly successful in persuading other people to follow his lead. And. People usually found that to their, to their advantage. I know that the people who've gotten involved in doing carbon nanotube work is a result of Rick saying, hey, this would be a good thing for you to do. Why don't you think about doing this? Uh, they, they've prospered. They've done extreme, extremely well scientifically out of, out of following up on these things. And, and Rick's charisma and his personal persuasiveness uh, were you know exemplified by his successful effort uh, to persuade the government to fund the nanotechnology initiative, national nanotechnology initiative. <coughs> anyway, Rick has contributed contributed a tremendous amount to the development of Rice University, and we miss it. So, I'll stop. Here, sorry I took up an hour. I didn't think that talk was going to last that long. Without asking permission, I'm sure Bob will answer questions for a while. Right. Oh, sure. <laughs> yes. We just gave him permission to answer questions. Yeah. Before he starts, I would like to clarify the remark about the Nobel Prize. What he said explicitly was, Rick Smalley just won a Nobel <laughs> Prize. He had never counted himself in that company, and the man was in total shock on that fateful morning I told you about. Mm. But, who, me? Mm. So. Bob, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Just a moment, I'll send you a microphone if I can get a microphone assistant. The uh, place that you, you had for potential energy sources, wind and solar, mm. are both basically very inefficient. That's, that's correct. And, uh, that, and geothermal was the only one I saw that you might say has the biggest untapped reservoir. Well, Could you comment on those? The, I guess that I would comment in the following way that there in the United States, I think there are two places for geothermal, right? One is in is Yellowstone Park, which people are not too eager to build power plants, and the other one is in California. Uh, Yellowstone Park is a super volcano, uh, and there's plenty of, of, you know, many geothermal activity there. Um, and the only other place in the world I know that's got super volcanoes is Iceland. So, uh, you know, Iceland is sitting pretty for geothermal energy, uh, but I, you know, I don't know that we are is a problem. Because, you know, the, the, it would be kind of a shame to develop Yellowstone Park as a geothermal energy plant. And, and, uh, and I think the California geothermal energy is fairly, fairly minor in comparison. Yeah, could you comment on... Uh, here, they, 
Oh. Could you comment on the uh, potential of fuel cells? Well, um, I don't know too much about fuel cells. Uh, the um, one of the I mean, there are two different issues. Uh, one is that uh, whether you're going to use convert hydrogen in them or methane or methanol, which what is going to be your fuel stock? Uh, it's the hydrogen fuel cells. The hydrogen electrode is very efficient, um, and I don't think it's. I don't think that you get the same sort of efficiency from methanol, for example, as or, or effectiveness from methanol. Um, the other thing is that um, there's an energy barrier for reducing you know, reducing oxygen. All you know, fuel cells are reducing you're reducing oxygen and, and uh, oxidizing your your fuel. And there's an energy barrier for that, which is called the, hydro, the oxygen overload, over voltage problem, which is, reduces the efficiency of fuel cells quite substantially. And the other thing is that although people are desperately looking for other metals that would be good electrode materials, I think that platinum is still by far the winner for, for electrode materials, and particularly with respect to the oxygen over voltage issue. And there, I've been told that there isn't enough platinum in the world to, to uh, you know, make a base in an economy on fuel cells it's, if we're going to have to use platinum electrodes. Now, people are trying to get away from platinum electrodes, but uh, that's, I've told you more than I know about this, so I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert in this. I've heard that in Brazil they have uh, cars that run on either ethanol or gasoline, no. and I have uh, heard it is their goal to be uh, independent of gasoline supplies. And I understand that it is from grow growing cr crops. Would you uh, comment on that, please? Well, I, I think it's true that that Brazil is doing you know lots with with ethanol. Um, they're making their ethanol by uh, from sugar cane. It's a it's a it's a sugar cane uh, 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 fermentation process. Um, the um, sugar cane uh, growing growing sugar cane requires enormous quantities of water. One of the main, you know you may have heard that the Lower Rio Grande Valley is running out of water. And one of the reasons it's running out of water is that they started growing sugar cane down there and uh, using the water from the Rio Grande to irrigate. Uh, and so there's, there's the issue of, of you know, you have, to have a, you have to have abundant rainfall. Uh, and, and the other thing that you have to know is that uh, the energy content of a given volume of ethanol is considerably lower than the energy content of the same volume of gasoline. Uh, so that if, you know, you, you have, uh, I don't know, I, I really don't know what the future of biomass is. I do know that all companies are working, have biomass programs, and they're, tr they're working on, on ethanol. So they need ethanol because that's prescribed for, for anti-knock. You, they, they, I don't know if you follow the story of the, what is it, T, MTB. Uh, you know, they, they got snookered into using that and then discovered that they had to pay to clean it up because uh, it stinks, stinks so bad in the water supplies. And so uh, it's been mandated now that they use ethanol. Uh, in, in, as, a, uh, as an anti-knock agent. And so they're all committed to ethanol for that purpose. Uh, the commitment to ethanol for, as a regular fuel is something that I don't think the oil companies are quite ready to make. Uh, there are people working on, on uh, methods of fermenting you know, cellulose, getting, getting ethanol or some fuel out of, out of cellulose. 
uh, and that would, because there's a whole lot more stalk than there is corn kernels. Uh, they, uh, and th that would, you know, that, that has a little bit more optimistic, bio biomass method uh, has a little bit more optimistic there. Thank you, Bob, very insightful. Would you say a little bit more about the interaction between Croto and Smalley? And in particular, Croto's prior interest in astrophysical uh, discovery of carbon so abundantly in outer space. How that influenced the fullerene revolution. Well, I, I'm not, I, no, I won't. <laughs> Let's put it this way, uh, uh, you know, well long before Rick died, uh, Rick and Harry were talking to each other. <laughs> but I won't really comment on the other on the thing. Now the um, the uh, is that the relationship uh, the um, the interest this project that we got that got us into this was an astrophysical project. Uh, the uh, uh, Harry had uh, obtained a spectrum in the laboratory of some carbon chain compounds. Uh, these were what are called cyanoacetylenes, and he'd observed these uh, in interstellar clouds. And there's a, there's a general theory about how molecules get made in interstellar clouds that's all based on ion molecule chemistry. Uh, because the clouds are very cold and you have to have something quite energetic to get chemical reactions started. Uh, and so uh, the, yeah, all of the, this theory based, was all based upon uh, cosmic rays ionizing the interstellar medium, uh, producing ions which will react with other species, many, have many reactions with other species, uh, even at very low temperatures that prevail in the interstellar medium. So, but Harry didn't feel that uh, these methods it offered any hope of an explanation for uh, the appearance of these carbon chain compounds. And so this experiment we were doing was, was the closest that Harry could imagine coming on Earth to the environment around a carbon star, where you, you uh, 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 carbon stars are unstable, they, they throw out uh, large amounts of gas into the interstellar medium, and he was figuring that the carbon that was thrown out uh, reacted with other carbon atoms to make these chains, and then, the, then uh, they pick up a nitrogen and a hydrogen to make the cyanoacetylenes. So uh, that was what the whole purpose of that was, and we wrote a paper about that sometime later, uh, about a year later, uh, discussing those experiments. Uh, the people, by the way, in, in Germany were all, who found this method of making the fullerenes were also involved in astrophysical, is doing it for an astrophysical purpose. So the, the nice thing about what your question, I didn't mean to reject your question, Lloyd, the nice thing about your question is to prove that, that, that uh, curiosity-driven science is not, can lead to things that are unexpected, things you never conceived might happen. happen. I had a question up here in the back. Uh, Dr. Carl, you mentioned that um, Dr. Smalley had an immense amount of charisma, but he also had a great uh, sense of humor. I'm told that uh, when he collected the Nobel Prize, uh, he did it in both the company of his wife and his ex-wife. Would you tell, care to comment on that? Uh, well, actually, um, that was, uh, I, yeah, he brought, them, he brought them both with him to Stockholm. They got along with each other famously. He would take them one to one event one night and he'd take the other to an event the other night, the next night. And in fact, I think they got along so well with each other that Rick got a little nervous about, <laughs> <laughs> about that. So. Yeah, question down there. You uh, <laughs> talked about the different things we could do to uh, increase our stores or our uh, uses of energy. The one thing that you didn't talk about is improving the efficiency of the systems we have today. The internal combustion engine, for example, is 35 percent efficient. Uh, AC power transmission is not nearly as efficient as DC power transmission. Oh. So we could take what we have today and double mm -hmm. its availability yeah. just by working on those types of systems. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so. Uh, 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, I think it's about to ask that question. <laughs> that's right. Thank you. <laughs> um, so anyway, this this is a this uh, this is an interesting fig factoid that uh, you can when just moving one light bulb will. And my uh, status as a moderator. Is that really a factoid, or is it exaggerated? <laughs> well, uh, I think what they're talking about is over the lifetime of the fluorescent lamp, which is probably, you know, they last quite a while. So it's uh, uh, pretty impressive. No and, and also, of course, it depends on the size of the lamp. <laughs> but <it's> like, <laughs> Uh, you know, to support that same theory right there, I just heard in the press that Australia has banned the incandescent yeah, light bulb, I think, in 10 years. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They, they've, they've, uh, they've, they've banned it, yeah. And, well, just let me go ahead and show them that just a minute more. So, you know, the new Boeing things are much more efficient. The new, the new Boeing uh, jetliners are much more efficient. This is... What this is, uh, is that if you're willing to pay 57 cents a gallon more for efficiency, you can save 69% of the energy. If you're willing to pay 25 cents a gallon more per gallon, this is per gallon, uh, you can save 65% on trucks. Uh, and you're already saving this, the 20% with these planes. And I don't know, uh, apparently they think this can be pushed forward further. I guess that's about it. Yeah, I only get through this. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to show you the other slides since I. So there are people thinking about. Rick was thinking about that. About you can save a lot. But. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, with uh, with uh, you, you make the point that of course, production of oil is declining yet consumption is rising, and those yeah. those lines have now crossed. And and uh, part of your message, as I understand it, is we must start now. On, on the new technologies. No. And I'm curious, sir, as to whether you found our government helpful, disinterested, supportive, hostile. Uh, what, what do you I, see? I, I, I have a slide for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the right one. OK. There, Rick, the roadblocks are sort of your middle of one, you know. Uh, you have to spend money on, re on research, okay? You have, to, you have to have a vision, but you have to have funding so you can do the hardware to do it. And this is the thing I wanted to show you. Uh, this is non-defense research and development for, by, uh, by function, okay? This is health. This is space. Uh, this is uh, this is energy. Oh, this is sorry. This is energy. Space is this. This the colors are kind of space is above this line and energy is above this line. Uh, and this is other natural uh, resources in the environment and general science. So. In terms of money being spent directly on energy research, it's become a very piddling part of the budget. This, remember, this was Jimmy Carter's moral equivalent of war for energy research right here. So it was taken a whole lot more seriously then. Where this was, you know, the Arab oil embargo precipitated that. Uh, but uh, the problem is that you, I think, uh, uh, you, the oil, the oil embargo, the Arab oil embargo was a shock, okay. Uh, I have a motto that goes, uh, uh, if you don't try to imagine the future, it will always be a surprise. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, like what improvement? Oh. Can you talk a little bit about what improvements for solar energy collection can be done and uh, with decreasing costs for energy? 
especially well, in regards maybe to, to nanophysics or something like that? Well, the, um, the, the, the situation is that if the kinds of solar panels that NASA uses are quite efficient. They're over 20% efficient converting sunlight and energy. They're very expensive. So it's all right to, you know, it costs a lot of thing, a lot of money to take something to the space station. So, so it's all right to pay a lot of money to, for the panels. Uh, the, the more the, the more normal panels tend to be something like five percent, have five percent efficiency, and cutting and converting, um, and they're still fairly expensive. These are the silicon panels. Uh, there are people that are trying to do this with nano. I guess you would call this nanotechnology. Um, Alan Heger, who got the Nobel Prize for uh, working on organic conductors, doing, developing organic conductors, is he's now at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, is working on developing solar cells that are mixtures of um, organic conductors and uh, C60. Uh, the uh, um, and the, the 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 hope is that um, since all you're using, at least for the active matrix, is carbon materials and carbon is relatively cheap, that maybe these this and the, and the layers have to be right, can be very thin. That this may be a cheaper way to go than with silicon. With silicon, you really need to have pretty pure silicon, and you have to have an n-type and p-type layers developed in the sil silicon, so it's not, uh, you know, I don't think it's intrinsically very inexpensive. So uh, the whole, uh, so far, the kind of efficiency he's been able to get is about 5%. And there are probably some stability issues, particularly with the organic conductors, uh, with respect to, uh, uh, how well they would live deployed in a field for a long time. They've, in the past, they've been pretty sensitive to photo-assisted air oxidation. So, but this, uh, you know, if he's, uh, I don't know that there are any problems that can't be solved in doing this, but he has been working on it for a while and hasn't made all that much progress. It's a hard question to, to say what the answer is. In other words, I don't see with the Alan Higgers approach, maybe that there's any fundamental issue, but maybe there, maybe I haven't thought about it long enough. He certainly has worked on it a while and hasn't made, as I said, much progress. There will be another question, but I want to get my oar back in the water. Mm -hmm. I rarely get a chance to remember that Bob Curl didn't remember something, but Jim Heath, one of the fabulous five shown up there, left Rice, went to the West Coast, and has made a remarkable reputation in very small things, uh, mm -hmm. nanotechnology of computer chip manufacture, and an interesting relationship with industry. So Rick Smalley not only taught, he taught by example. Yeah. You know, well, Jim has done extremely well. I, it wasn't a direct answer to the question because, uh, you know, I don't think, I don't know what Jim is doing on solar power, but he's, he certainly made, he's, He's a, a, a professor at Caltech. He's got a research group of about 20 people. Uh, he's doing work uh, in molecular, molecular electronics. Just recently had a, uh, reported a molecular memory uh, chip. And he also is doing work in, um, in medis, medical research. Effectively, what he's trying to do is to develop the Chemi analytical chemistry methods for uh, the, the field of the growing field of molecular medicine, or the po possible field of molecular medicine. We, uh, there's a guy named Lee Hood. You may or may not have ever heard of him or hear, heard him talk, but but he is uh, pro pro pushing the new vision in medicine, where effectively uh, you know so much about the uh, uh, enzyme control and regulatory mechanisms that uh, you can tell what's going on by by what proteins are present in the blood uh, because everything leaks into the blood uh, and so 
you know, Jim Heath is working on how you analyze blood for specific proteins using nanoscale things. Chris had a question. Uh, you, you talked about uh, one application of the nanotubes, the, uh, the high tension wires. What other uh, applications were envisioned and even just batted about uh, to well, give us some if, ideas? I don't know if Wade can restrain himself. <laughs> <laughs> Question like that, and the, uh, <laughs> there you go, Wade. <laughs> I'll mention Hydril, and because that's the one that's closest to commercial application, and you can talk about the rest. There, there are literally hundreds of applications for carbon nanotubes, um, ranging across a whole variety of energy applications, even uh, oil recovery, um, downhole, et cetera, making, if you put a half a percent of the right functionalized nanotubes in rubber, you can double the strength, increase the temperature resistance by 100 degrees uh, at only a half a percent concentration. Um, and that's actually being uh, commercialized here in Houston by Hydril. Um, there are applications in fuel cells, there are applications in um, uh, capacitors for electric, electrical storage. Uh, there are computing applications in principle mixing semiconductors and conducting nanotubes, you can make a computer uh, out of nanotubes that would be much, much smaller and use a lot less energy. That's probably a few years off, but you know, it's one of the possible ways we'll go beyond Moore's law when it runs out of gas in about 10 years or so. Um, if you go to the Carbon Nanotechnologies Incorporated website, I think they list probably 100 applications that they're interested in pursuing or hoping people pursue for what nanotubes are going to do for uh, new discoveries, new new inventions, and new applications. I mean, that's a subject we could probably spend hours on, but uh, there's no shortage of applications. What's, a, what's short is um, probably funding for the fundamental research that's needed to spread out and do all of these different things. That's just a, a, t a taste of it. Yeah. Sure. Good time. Last call. There's one more right there. This is going to be our last question, I believe. So. I apologize to everyone else here if this question is not adequate to being the last one. Um, I'm just curious. You flashed by a slide a couple of times that on the very top says Rick Smalley's suggested reading list. Oh, yeah, and I just wonder if you would give us a peek at that. It could be that there's nothing on there that I would understand at all, but I'd just like to look and see what it says. Thank you, sir. Oh, by the way, I didn't show you. He pointed out <laughs> what the energy research element is. <laughs> okay, so this is, let me get out of this, and I was very much strong. There's a, there's a catch about science, and this is what Rick, the reason that Rick says we should be concerned about the energy prices uh, is the people behind him. Um, Okay, so this is, sorry, this is all about this. Okay, uh, now I'll get to the reading assignment. So, uh, let's see if we can, if we can wait where I can see it. The, um, these are books I, about, about uh, oil. Hubbard's Peak is this peak in production that I alluded to several times. Um, the, um, so I don't know whether I can leave that up there if I'm, if, if I guess there's no, it's on the, it's on, which, what's the website? Uh, let's see, it's, The, the Smalley Institute website, nano.rice.edu, uh, on the front page are pointers to a couple of copies of presentations that yeah, uh, there, I've been giving I've, that include I, uh, this slide in particular. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, track down some of the books. Or you could send us an email. We could send you a, a copy mm -hmm. of it. Uh, there's probably triple this number now that have come out just in the last uh, couple years, too. If, if you haven't gotten it already, oh. The, uh, a lot of the things that I've 
talked about a lot of the slides that I've shown uh, have come from Rick via Wade uh, in some, some way to that of his own, I think, to this list. Um, to, uh, so uh, you probably got that already, but I should disclose fully that I, I have committed the crime of uh, plagiarism quite extensively in this talk. <laughs> I would like to thank Bob on behalf of all of us for a thoroughly entertaining afternoon. <laughs>